All right, right before we pray, let me just once again honor uh, Bishop T.D. Jakes and his wife, First Lady Sarita Jakes. Thank you so much for inviting me and having me be a part of this. Thank you. God bless you. I appreciate your graciousness. Appreciate your hospitality and your staff has just been outstanding. They've treated me warmly and I just want to say thank you. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for making me feel at home and a part of Woman Thou Art Loose, even though this is my first time. I really, really appreciate it. God bless you. Amen. All right, why don't you stand to your feet? We're going to pray, and then we'll go right into the Word of God. And if you have your Bibles, we're going to be going through a lot of scriptures today. And so if you'll turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3, and then you'll bow your heads and we'll pray, and we'll get right into the lesson for today. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity to fellowship together around your word. Father, I thank you for clear articulation of speech and clarity of thought as we make known the mysteries of the gospel. God, I thank you that every ear is open to hear, every heart is open to receive, and our lives will be the better after having heard the word of God today and applied the principles of the word to our lives. Holy Spirit, I'm dependent on you, that you'll think with my mind, that you'll speak with my lips, and that the compassion of Jesus flows out of my heart. And Father, I set my faith in agreement with the prayer that I prayed earlier today, that you give unto me utterance and boldness to make known the mysteries of the gospel. And Father, you know it's our desire to know you more perfectly, that we might serve you more faithfully. Father, I thank you that every person here will not leave this place the same way that they've come today, but that our lives will be transformed by the word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. If you have your Bibles, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. And as I said a few moments ago, I'm going to be teaching from a lesson from a book that I did several years ago on how to dream beyond your means. And it's amazing to me that all of the speakers this week have been talking about dreaming and about giving birth to those things that are on the inside of you. And I kind of thank God that I was placed toward the end of the meeting today so that I could teach you on how to dream beyond your means because this is a work workshop. And in a workshop, a workshop teaches you how to do what you're supposed to do. And so since everybody has taught us on dreaming all week, I'm going to let you leave here today with the how-tos on how to get to that place that God has for you. Because believe it or not, God has an incredible life ahead for you. God has things that he wants you to do because God can't move in the earth without your permission and your participation. So you dreaming is very important to the plan of God being fulfilled in the earth. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think, all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. And now I'm going to be reading a lot of my scriptures from the Amplified Bible. And so from the Amplified, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 says, Now to him who by, by in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly far over and above all that we dare ask or think infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes or dreams. Now this scripture alone tells us that God has a supernatural life planned for us. You know, my husband and I live an incredible life, but we didn't start off living an incredible life. We both grew up in the ghetto. We both grew up, uh, my husband grew up basically in a three room house, not a three bedroom house, but a three room house. And I grew up in a house that was sit up on blocks. But what happened to our lives to get us from where we were to to where we are right now. We learned the principles of the word of God and we found out that it was the will of God for us to live a life distinctively different from the world. You know, uh, I showed a copy of my book and I think that they have a copy of it to show up on the screen. And on that book, you'll see me standing in front of my Bentley. And uh, that is not a computer generated picture. That is a real picture. That's a real car that I own that was given to me by my husband for my 25th wedding anniversary. 
and I'm standing in front of a house that God gave us. It's a house that's been built for the body of Christ. It was built because we wanted to be able to demonstrate to other ministers that it's the will of God for you to live a super abundant life. We, it was reported to us at the time we built our house that we had the largest house in the state of Texas. It's 33,000 square feet, not 3,300 square feet, but 33,000 square feet. We have five houses behind the main house, and they're 2,500 square feet each. Then we have an exercise house that's another 2,500 square feet. We have an Olympic-sized swimming pool in the back, and then we have a tennis court on the other side, and then we have a walking track that's one mile, and then we have a lake that's stocked with fish. Why? Because we learned the principles of the Word of God, and we dare to dream beyond our means. Well, you might say, well, that just happened to you because you're a preacher's wife. No, I'm the same preacher's wife that got my car repossessed because we couldn't pay our bills. It happened because I learned the principles of the word of God and I dared to dream beyond my means. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter five. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, it didn't just happen because she's a preacher's wife. Because let me tell you something. I know a lot of preachers' wives that don't live like I live. I know a lot of preachers' wives that don't have what I have. And I was a preacher's wife when my family was eating beans and rice for dinner. I was a preacher's wife when we had a Cornish hen to split between my husband and my two kids and I. I was a pastor's wife then. Well, what happened? Well, God showed us how to use the principles of faith and transform our lives. And I'm obligated to show you so that you can get to where God wants wants you to be. Amen. Hallelujah. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, God wants you to dream beyond your means. Because you know why? We serve a supernatural God. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, we serve a supernatural God. We just got through reading a scripture that says he's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ever ask or think. All of those words are superlative words. God wants to add to your life. He doesn't want to take from your life. Hey man, trying to tell your neighbor, say God wants to give you an add to life. Hallelujah. So in the context of this lesson, let me define what I mean about a dream. I'm not talking about those images that flow through your head at night when you've eaten the wrong thing. But in the context of this teaching, hallelujah, in the context of this teaching, a dream is a God-inspired hope, directive, or expectation planted in the spirit of a man or a woman and made visible on that man or the, on the, made visible on the canvas of that man or that woman's imagination that calls for action on the part of the dreamer. Let me give it to you once again. A dream is a God-inspired hope, directive or expectation planted in the heart of a man of a, in the spirit of a man of a, or a woman and made visible on that man or that woman's imagination that calls for action on the part of the dreamer. Now, even though God gives the dream, you have to do your part. You know, many people look at my husband and I and they say, well, everything they got, it just happened overnight. No, it didn't. It took a lot of effort to get where we are. And so even though God gives you the dream, you've got to put forth the effort to bring the dream to pass. You should be at Ecclesiastes chapter five verse nine, by now, right? All right, it's on page 863 of the Light Sword Bible. For those of you who have the Light Sword Bible, and you know, we say you're not serious about going to heaven if you, if you don't have a Light Sword Bible. That's just a joke. You were supposed to laugh. Amen. So if you're going to bring your dreams to pass, you're going to have to put forth effort. effort. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 3 says, For a dream cometh through a multitude of business. And the Amplified says, for a dream comes with much business and painful effort. I am literally living my dreams, but it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen by me just sitting around saying, God has given me a dream. No, it happened because I put forth the effort to bring God's dream to pass in my life. Now flip over to Psalms 37, Psalms 37. 
You know, when my husband and I, uh, doing the introduction, they said that we uh, have a church of 22,000 members, and uh, we have one church in multiple locations. We have a location, two locations in the Houston area, one location in Beaumont, one location in Austin, and then we also have a drug rehab center. Well, believe it or not, nobody picked us up one day on the side of the road and said, hey, it's a church over there on Green's Road, and one on Fondren, and one in Beaumont, and one in Austin, and it's a lot of people there that want to hear the word of God? No, it came because we put forth the effort to bring God's will to pass in our lives. Amen. So if you're going to bring your dreams to pass, you're going to have to work. Amen. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, you're going to have to work. And you know, the main thing that you got to work on is you've got to work on your heart because many times God wants to put the dream in your heart, but we got our hearts so corrupted with jealousy and competition and strife and all kinds of things that it's choking out the seed of the dream that God wants to put in your heart. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, get your heart right. Amen. Because a dream is just like a seed. A seed doesn't look anything like what it will become. A dream is just like a seed. It looks nothing like what it will become. Hey, man, I mean, you know, just think about it. 18 years ago or 17 years ago, when God told my husband to build a church where we would teach the word of God, where people would come, be healed, set free, delivered by the power of God, and we would stand and teach the word of God, and he gave him the name of New Life Church World Outreach and Worship Centers. Well, at the time when, we, when he made the grand announcement, we thought everybody would be excited that we were going to teach the word of faith and that people's lives were going to be changed and that they were going to be blessed. Well, it, at the time, he made the announcement we had 300 people in church that Sunday, the first Sunday in September 1984. Well, the second Sunday in September, 277 people say, we are not coming back to church because you dropped the Baptist name. So here we were with 23 people saying that New Life Church World Outreach and Worship Centers, it looked nothing like what it would become. Amen. But we had a dream on the inside of our heart, and those 23 people have multiplied to 22,000. Why? Because it didn't look like anything well, like it would become. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, your dream is like a seed. It looks nothing like what it will become. All right. Uh, Psalms 37, verse 1 says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, Neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Then verse 4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. And verse 4 in the Amplified says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires and secret petitions of your heart. Now, this scripture literally means that God will drop into your heart dreams and desires that he wants to bring to pass in your life. Then it also means that those dreams and desires that are on the inside of you, as you delight Delight yourself in the Lord, God will give those dreams and those desires to you. But what you have to do is you don't you don't reject reject the dream seed that God's putting on the inside of you. And many times when God puts a seed on the inside of you as a dream, we reject we reject the dream seed because the seed is in a dormant state until it can be introduced to the proper environment. You know how many times you'll see an apple seed? Well, an apple seed in a package won't grow up to be an apple tree. An apple seed sitting on this stage will not become an apple tree. Until you put the apple seed in the ground and cultivate the ground, then it'll grow up to be an apple tree. So just like your dream is in a dormant state until you introduce it to the right environment. And that's why it's so important to hang around other dreamers. Amen. Because why? When you hang around other dreamers, they produce the environment necessary for your dream to grow. Amen? And then like a seed, a dream is in a state where it has untapped potential. There's so much on the inside of a seed, but until it's introduced to the right environment, it will not produce what it needs to produce. But we reject it many times because it just doesn't have, it doesn't look like what it's going to become. And then it doesn't have the, it doesn't look like it has the potential to be what it's going to be. Amen. And then the seed always is going to bring increase. Amen. Because when you put an apple seed in the ground, you don't just get one apple. 
Amen. So when you introduce the dream seed to the right environment, it will always bring increase. Amen. And then a dream seed is normally rejected because it's beyond the resources you have at the time. Amen. Many times God will put a dream in your heart and the first thing you'll do is say, I don't have the money. I don't know how it's going to happen. I don't know how it's going to come to pass. Well, remember I told you that the dream is like a seed and it's what it wants to do. It wants to tap on untapped potential that's on the inside of you. You know, I can remember when we started our church and I don't even have to think real hard about how much money we had at the time. You know, when God told us one church in multiple locations, he said for us to build a church where we would have an uh, influence in the north side of Houston and the south part of Houston. Well, you know, at the time, we didn't have the resources. We didn't know how it was going to happen. But we believed in the dream that was on the inside of our hearts. And so we went out driving in the south part of Houston, and we got no witness in the south part of Houston. And so we started driving in the north part of Houston, and we saw this warehouse building. And um, we drove up to the warehouse, and I said, Ira, that's the place. And he said, who's going to come to church in a warehouse? And I said, well, Ira, just pray about it. And that may be a word to those of you who are wives. You know, you don't have to nag. You don't have to be bad dream. You don't have to do anything. If you believe God put a dream on the inside of your heart, you just pray about it. Tell your mate to pray about it. And God will bring it to pass. Well, we, um, we ended up going, our pastor went and prayed about it. And we ended up going into the office of the man who owned the building. And we told him we wanted to rent space for him. And at the time, how much money do you think we had? No money. But we knew that we had a dream on the inside of our hearts. And so we went into the man's office and we sat in his office. We said, we want to rent a space from you to have a church in this building. And he said to us, he said, OK, how much square feet do you need? So I think we started off with like 6,500 square feet in this building. And uh, he said, OK, it's going to take about $250,000 to renovate the building. And so we said, OK. You know, we were sitting there, OK. <laughs> OK. And so uh, he said, um, he said, well, what I'll do is I'll get a loan from my bank and we'll re renovate the building to make it look like a church. He said, but what you need to do is you need to give me first month, last month's rent and a deposit. Now, uh, remember, how much money did we have? Because why? The dream see, many times is rejected because you don't have all the resources. So we knew that this was the place that God wanted us to be. So we sat there and Ira said, he said, OK, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'm going to give you this check. He said, but I'm going to tell you right now, this check is no good. <laughs> but see, what you do is when you've got a dream in your heart, you go as far as your integrity will take you. You know, we didn't give him the check and let him put the check in the bank and then the check bounced and he called us and said, your check came back and we're like, oh, what happened? No, we told him right then. We say, this check is no good. And then we said, but this is how we plan to make it good. If we don't have the money by this date, we'll have it by this date. If we don't have it by this date, we'll have it by this date. If we don't have it by this date, we'll have it by this date. And so the man reached across his desk and he said, preacher, you got a deal. <laughs> Hallelujah. And now check this out. Check this out. We gave the man the check. Remember how much money we had. How much did we have? Now, you can't reject the dream seed because you don't have the resources. We had no money, but we gave him a check and we gave him a promise. And after we shook his hand, my husband, with his bold step of faith, he said, one day I'm going to own this complex. He said, your office is going to be my office. Your wife's office is going to be my office. Now, we just gave the man a check and told the man the check was no good. And we up here prophesying, we're going to buy your building. Why? Because we had a dream on the inside of us. And guess what? His office is his office. His wife's office is my office. And we own the entire complex. Why? Because we didn't reject the dream seed. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, don't reject the seed. Hallelujah. Glory. And me, my husband and I, we have this statement. You don't need finishing grace until you start. 
because God will give you more on your way than he does when you get started. So those of you who are pastors, wives, and preachers in the house, don't reject the dream seed that God puts on the inside of you just because you don't have the money. God wants you to get started. And once you get started, then God will give you the grace to complete it. Hallelujah. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, don't reject the dream seed. All right, and then many times people reject the dream seed because the dream seed is normally beyond what you can believe at this time. But guess what? Mark 9, 23 says, if thou canst believe, all things are possible for him that believes. And then many times people reject the dream seed because it makes a demand on untapped potential. And then this last one is the one that really gets people tripped up. Turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Many people reject the dream seed because it will invoke immediate persecution. Many people reject the dream seed. Why? Because it will invoke immediate persecution. People are going to be talking about you. Now, I'm going to be using a lot of my own personal experiences and personal testimonies in this lesson. But over the course of time of teaching the word of faith, my husband has taught us that there are four things that you need if you're going to walk in any spiritual truth. Number one, you need a revelation. That's an understanding of the word of God at the level of your comprehension. Number two, you need a role model, and I'm going to serve as your role model today. Number three, you need a regimen of faith, and that's a systematic way of how to apply the truth that you found in the Word of God, and I plan to teach you that today. And then number four, you need a righteous resolve, and that's something that you have to do. You have to resolve in your heart that I want a dream to come to pass in my life, not for my own selfish reasons, not for me to brag and boast about what I have, but for me to give glory to God. Amen. So if you're going to bring forth the dreams to pass in your life, you need a role model. So I'm going to be using a lot of my own personal testimony. And when we started our church 23 years ago, we had to deal, I mean, 18 years ago with 23 people, we had to deal with some immediate persecution. I mean, can you imagine? We are pastoring a church with 300 people. And then the next Sunday, we got 23. Everybody was talking about us. One of, the, one of the pastors in the city who said he was filled with the Holy Ghost, who said he believed in the power of the Holy Ghost, he called Ira on the phone and said, Ira, what is wrong with you? He said, that stuff will work for Fred Price in California because them people in California are movie stars and stuff like that. They'll sit in church and read their Bible and listen to somebody teach for an hour from the Word. That ain't going to work in Houston. Immediate persecution. How many of y'all know he lied? Yeah. Turn and tell your neighbor and say, he lied. So don't let persecution bother you. Our own church, the church that we grew up in, the church that we met each other in, the church that we got married in, our pastor stood up in church with my mother and father sitting on the front row, stood up in church and said, y'all pray for Iron Bridget. They're just a little off, and he got Bridget over there caught up in it. Immediate persecution. But see, persecution doesn't affect you if you don't need acceptance from the person that's persecuting you. Hallelujah. To the degree that you need acceptance from the person, the person who is persecuting you, that's the degree that persecution will affect you. If I don't need acceptance from you, you talk about me if you want to. And while you're talking, I'm on my way to the bank. Glory to God. So don't let anybody abort your dream. Turn and tell your neighbor and say, don't let anybody abort your dream. Now, the big question is, what would you dream if you knew you couldn't fail? What would you dream if you knew you couldn't fail? What would you dream if you knew you couldn't fail? Turn and ask your neighbor, say, what would you dream if you knew you couldn't fail? Because see, what you have to do is you've got to understand that there is no failure in God. The Bible says that God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ever ask or think according to the power that's working in you. The Bible says in Mark 9, 23, if you can believe it, all 
things are possible to him that believe it. So what you have to do is you got to stop getting everybody else's dream for you and get God's dream for you. You know, the Bible says in Psalms 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Well, guess what? I found that scripture about 20 years ago, and I said, wait a minute. Not blessed is the man, blessed is Bridget. I don't walk on the counsel of the ungodly. I don't stand in the way of sinners. I don't sit in the seat of the scoffer. My delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law do I meditate day and night. Therefore, I shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. I bring forth my fruit in my season. My leaves not shall not wither, and whatsoever I do will prosper. That was God's dream for me. Hallelujah. Then I found God. I know you're in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, but turn over to Psalms 112. Hallelujah. You got to get God's dream for you. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, you got to get God's dream for you. Hallelujah. Psalms 112. This is God's dream for your family. It says, praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighted greatly in his commandments. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Look at verse three. It says, wealth and riches shall be in his house. I found that scripture and I said, I don't walk, I don't fear, I fear the Lord. I reverence him for who he is. The gener- and I start saying, hey, I'm upright. So the generation of the upright shall be blessed. I call Tina blessed. I call Terry blessed. I call Arisha blessed. I call Jeffrey blessed. I call Prashia blessed. I call my grandkids blessed. Why? Because I'm the upright. And then when I found this scripture, we had a house full of furniture that was veneer over particle board. You know how it is, that shiny stuff. The kind that you don't want to sit in unknown it because if you do, it'll leave a ring on the furniture. We had a house full of that at our house, and I found out that wealth and riches were supposed to be in my house. So I started saying, wealth and riches are in my house. And so what I did was I started going to model homes to see how model homes were supposed to look. Why? Because God's dream for me was that wealth and riches be in my house. So I needed to see how the wealthy folk live, you know. So I started going to model homes and looking at model homes and I started walking through the model homes. I said, this is supposed to be in my house. This is supposed to be in my house. Wealth and riches are supposed to be in my house. So I started saying that. Why? Because that was God's dream for me. So guess what? Today when people walk in my house, they start looking around and they say, does anybody live here? This looks like a model home. My dream that God had for me came to pass in my life. Why? Wealth and riches are now in my house. Hallelujah. Turn to Psalms 115. Psalms 115. Hallelujah. This is God's dream for your finances. Psalms 115 verse 12. The Lord had been mindful of us. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, did you know you were on God's mind? (laughs) And guess what? God is not thinking about how your husband talked about you before you left to come to this weekend. God is not thinking about how your children was acting up before you came to this weekend. Look at what God's thinking about. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. That's what God is thinking about you. He's thinking about how 
can he increase you and your children more and more? Then the Bible says in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts that God has for me, thoughts to prosper me and to give me a future. So it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks about me. I think what God thinks about me. Hallelujah. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, don't let the world put you in a box. Why? Because box thinkers don't ever get anything. Hallelujah. Box thinkers are those persons who are marked by the status quo, marked by stereotypes, marked by the statistics of the norm. We're not normal. At least I'm not normal. I'm distinctively, necessarily different. Why? Because my father says he wants me to be blessed. So it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. My father wants me to have the best. My father wants me to eat the best. My father wants me to drive the best. My father wants me to live in the best. So I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what anybody else does. It's too late to talk me out of what God wants for me. You know, a lot of people try to put down the message of faith. You know, they say, God doesn't want you to have things. And don't pray for things. You know, and they always try to put the faith message down. Well, don't let nobody talk you out of your faith. Let me tell you something. It's too late to talk me out of faith. I ain't going to let the world put me in a box and say, that faith doesn't work. Jack is already out the box. <laughs> You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that God gives us natural things so that we can understand spiritual things. Okay, mediocrity get no attention. It's the people who are above average that get all the attention. You know, when I was in school, uh, thank God I was a straight-A student. I graduated number three in my high school class and uh, went on to go to college on a scholarship, but uh, didn't finish college, ended up making some bad choices and uh, messed up my life, but that's okay. But in the grading system in school, when I was in school, an 89 was an average student. But when you made a 90, you were considered above average. So it just takes a little bit extra effort to be above average. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, man, I didn't know that. <laughs> so all it takes is you putting forth a little bit extra effort to be distinctively, necessarily different in the body of Christ. You know, think about this, in the Olympics, you know, I like to watch the Olympics, and in the Olympics, you know how when they first start off for the relay race, they get everybody that's in the line, everybody that's going to run. Then at the end of the thing, when it's finished and the person that comes across the finish line, the first person that comes across the line, all the cameras are on them. What about all them other people? They never show them again. Turn and 
tell you, neighbor said mediocrity gets no attention. You know, the other day I was watching the tennis matches, and I love the twins, the, the, the sisters, Venus and Serena. They're distinctively necessarily different for us as a people. And so, you know, when they were playing the doubles, you know, they were showing the people that they were playing against and everything. And then when the doubles was over and Venus and Serena won, we didn't see them other people no more. Why? Because they weren't distinctively necessarily different. Well, we're the body of Christ. We don't need to look like the world. We don't need to act like the world. Why? Because our father owns the cattle of a thousand hills. And then the Bible says he even owns the hills that the cattle graze on. So what of it if I can't have me a steak every now and then? My daddy owned the cattle. Then the Bible says his streets are not paved with gold. His streets are made with gold. So what's wrong with me having a little bling bling every now and then? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, mediocrity gets no attention. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. You know, if you allow them to, the world will set limitations on you. Because the world wants to keep you in a box. It started as early when you were in elementary school. You just didn't realize that was what they were trying to do. They were trying to set limitations on what you could have and what you could do. Because I thought about this. I said, you know, I'm in elementary school. My mom and dad bought me new clothes to go to kindergarten. They gave me paper, colors, and all the good stuff you're supposed to have your first day of school. So I get in school, and then the, the teacher, she says, color your papers, but stay within the lines. Why? It's my paper. It's my colors. Why do I have to stay within the line? They were trying to set me in a box. Don't let the world put you in a box. Because why? Dreamers always conquer everything. In a doubting world, dreamers believe. In a slow world, dreamers run. In a quitting world, dreamers persevere. And in a world where there's no hope, dreamers believe God. Hallelujah. Turn and tell your neighbor and say, be a dreamer. Hallelujah, because mediocrity gets no attention. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 14. There was a little city and few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it, bulwarks against it. Now there was found in that in it a poor wise man. And he by his wisdom delivered the city. Yet no man remembered that same poor man. Why did they forget him? Because he didn't have nothing to show for his wisdom. He didn't have no money. He was poor. So you being poor is not going to get nobody's attention. You need to be remembered for the good things that God has done for you. You need to be remembered. Hey, she left a legacy in this earth. The Bible says that we should leave a legacy in the earth. That our children ought to be blessed and our children's children ought to be blessed. It'd be a sad thing for me to leave this earth and my children got to suffer. My children don't be able to have anything. No, the Bible says my children's children should enjoy the inheritance that I've left for them. Amen. So I want to be remembered as the woman who had it together. I want to be the woman who's remembered as a woman who had a dream and pursued her dream. I want to be remembered as God's leading lady. Hallelujah. 
Turn and tell your neighbor and say, you don't know me right now, but you will remember me. Hallelujah. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Because believe it or not, you have been engineered by God to be successful. You've been already engineered by God to be a success in this life. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Now unto Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship. How many of you say you're born again? All right, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. And then the Amplified says, for we are God's own handiwork, his workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we might do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand, beforehand for us, taking the past which he prepared ahead of time that we should walk in them, living the good life. Hallelujah. Living the good life. Living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. God has already engineered you with everything that you need to be successful in life. You know, when God made the fish, he didn't have to tell the fish, get in this water and swim. Why? Because he'd already put in the fish everything that he needed to swim. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God, the Bible says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female, that's me, created he them, that they would have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over everything that creepeth upon the earth. So God said, hey, when he made man, he didn't just make male man, he made female man. So I am not an afterthought in the mind of God. When God made me, he put in me everything that I need to reign in this life. So I'm already engineered. I'm already created to reign in this life. And we just read Ephesians 2.10. He prearranged the path for me to live the good life. All God is waiting for you to do is to step on the plan. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, step on the plan. Turn and tell them again, say, step on the plan. Because guess what? Dreamers are not set apart at birth, nor are they born thinking creativity, creatively. But at some point, by a choice and conscious effort, they choose to break out of the mold of the status quo and develop a conscious, systematic approach to life. We must understand the importance of a God-given dream. Because in, in order for God to work in the earth, God needs man's permission and man's participation. And the Bible reveals that God uses dreams to communicate his purpose and his plan for mankind in the earth. Because when God got ready to do something, he always looked for a man. When God wanted to deliver the children of Israel, the Bible says that God looked for a man by the name of Joseph and gave him a dream. When God wanted to restore dignity to the nation of Jerusalem and rebuild the wall, the Bible says God gave Nehemiah a dream. When, when God wanted to bring unity in the earth, the Bible says that God took Ezekiel in a valley and put him in a valley of dry bones. In a vision, he saw the bones coming together. So when he needed to preach the message of unity, he already had the dream on the inside of him. So God has to use mankind to bring his will to pass in the earth because the only legal right God has to get his will to come to pass in the earth is through a human vessel. How many of you say, God, use me? Turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 16. 2 Chronicles chapter 16. God is looking for some dreamers. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, God is looking for some dreamers. 2 Chronicles 16 verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart are perfect towards him. God wants to show off in you. 
Why not just lift up your hands and say, God, show off in me. Amen, because God wants to show off in you. The Bible says in Job 36, 11, if they obey and serve him, they shall spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. God's looking for somebody who just obey him and serve him so he can show off in them. Then in Isaiah 1, 19 says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. God's looking for somebody who'll be willing and obedient so they can eat the good of the land. And guess what? The sinners need to see some believers that's got it together. Because the way to a sinner's heart is through his eyes. The Bible says that we are the light of the world. And if we are the light of the world, we can't be a candle up under a bushel, but we got to sit on a hill so that men can see the good works of God and glorify the Father. Amen? So the sinners need to see some Christians who got it together. It's time out for them testimony services. Standing up saying, I, you know, I'm going to serve God anyway. My lights got cut off this morning, but hallelujah, I'm serving God anyway. God don't need that. A sinner don't want to hear that because you know what they'll say? My goodness, God can't take care of his own children. I might be a burden for him coming in the kingdom of God. So the sinner needs to see some believers who got it together. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, I got it together. Hey, and don't hate. Don't hate because you got it together. Don't hate because your sister got it together. Instead of hating, you need to congratulate. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, congratulate me. Why are you being congratulated? Congratulate you for spending your hundred dollars to register so you could be known as one of God's leading ladies. Hallelujah. Turn and tell your neighbor and say, don't hate. Congratulate. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So what you have to do is you got to get a dream inside of you that's bigger than you. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, you must get a dream inside of you that's bigger than you. Turn to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. Hallelujah. And the key to getting out of your present situation of lack is not... It's not the, looking at the situation of lack, but looking at the dream that's on the inside of you. The key to getting out of your present situation of lack is the dream that you have in your heart. Proverbs 29, verse 18, say, where there's no vision, the people perish. And then the Amplified says, where there's no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. A God-inspired dream will deliver you from your perishing predicament. A God-inspired dream will deliver you from your perishing predicament. And you must receive a dream inside of you that's bigger than you. And for God to bring his will to pass in the troubled areas of your life, you must receive God's dream for that area. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, a God-inspired dream dream will deliver you you from your perishing predicament. And you know, we've been uniquely designed by God to function in concert with how we see ourselves. You know, in Numbers chapter 13, it talks about the children of Israel. The Bible says that, you know, what's so amazing to me about that story is that the children of Israel went over into the land. They came back with the fruit of the land. They had evidence that the land was just like what God said. But because of how they saw themselves, they could not take the land. So how you see yourself will determine whether you will have the dream that's on the inside of your heart come to pass. So a God-inspired dream will deliver you from your perishing predicament. Because the children of Israel had, had the results of the land. The Bible says in verse 33, they said, we, we, we saw the giants in the land. In other words, we went over there, we saw exactly what God said. Then it says, but we saw ourselves as grasshoppers. And the way they saw themselves is the way they said the other people saw them. So how you perceive that you are is the way you think others perceive that you are. So if you get a God-inspired dream on the inside of you, you'll change the way you see yourself. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, a God-inspired dream will deliver you from your perishing predicament. 
in our belief system does not easily recognize the difference between an imagined thing or a real thing. Because many times you can have a dream that's so real. I mean, not, I'm not talking about the dream, a God-inspired dream, but you could have a dream in your sleep that's so real. I mean, you can be laying down and you can see somebody chasing you. I mean, you'll be sweating, you'll be perspiring, you'll be doing everything just like you're running. And then you wake up right before the catch and you be like, whew, I'm glad that was a dream. <laughs> So your belief system does not easily recognize the difference between what's imagined and what's very real. So what God wants to do is through meditation cause you to get his dream for you. That's why the Bible says in Psalms 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the sinful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night because God wants you to get his image of you on the inside of you. So the, what you do when you meditate is you just simply see yourself like the scripture says. You imagine yourself being a person that's like a tree planted by the rivers of water. You're bringing forth your fruit in your season. Your leaf is not withering. Whatever you do prospers. And don't let the world talk you out of meditation. You know, meditation is God's plan to transform your belief system. If you want to change your belief system, you start meditating on God's will for your life. You know, every time the Bible talks about meditation, then later on it talks about you prospering. Joshua 1 and 8 says, meditate in the word day and night, day and night. He told Joshua, observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Meditation is God's will to transform your thinking. 2 Timothy 4 and 15 says, if thou meditate on these things, give thyself wholly unto them, then shall thy profiting appear to all. So what you do in your secret closet of meditating on what God has told you, when you come out, everybody will know she's been spending time with God. Hey Amen. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, don't down meditation. So I know what you're saying. I hear you. I hear you. The big question is, well, Dr. Bridget, how do I dream beyond my means with lack and limitations all around me? How can I possibly dream beyond my means? Well, that's a good question, and I'm going to tell you how to do it. The first thing that you've got to do is you've got to understand that you serve a God who is extreme. You don't serve no little mamdy pamdy God. You serve a God who wants to do more for your life than you could ever even imagine. If you can think it, God says, is that all? <laughs> if you can imagine it, God says, that ain't it. Why? John 10.10 10 says that the thief coming to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus Christ said, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And the Amplified says he came to give us life. That's super abundant, overflowing kind of life. God wants you to have a super abundant, overflowing kind of life. God is a God of extreme. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, God is a God of extreme. He wants you to be extremely blessed. Let me tell you why I know he's a God of extreme. The Bible says the children of Israel were getting ready to go to run and get away from Pharaoh and his army. And they got to the Red Sea. And the Bible says that they got to the Red Sea and they realized that Pharaoh and his army were behind them. How many of you know the story? All right, Pharaoh and his army were behind them. And the Bible says that Moses stretched out his rod and the waters departed on both sides. How many of you know, with Pharaoh and his army behind him, the children of Israel would have been happy sloshing through the mud. They would have been glad to just run through the mud to get away from Pharaoh. But the Bible says that God rolled back the water and he made the ground dry. So they walked across on dry land. He's an extreme God. Then the Bible talks about how Jesus was there in the wilderness and the people were hungry. And the Bible says that he asked for, the, what do we have? And they said, all we have is two fish and five loaves of bread. And the Bible says he lifted them up to heaven and gave thanks for them. And then he fed 5,000 men besides women and children. And then he said, let them eat until they're full. And then when they were all full, the Bible says they took up 12 baskets left over. Why? Because God is an extreme God. 
When Joshua and the children of Israel got to get, got ready to take over Jericho, the Bible says that, you know, we serve an extreme God. Say, we serve an extreme God. The Bible says they walked around the wall seven times and they were getting ready to go into the land. And the Bible says that the wall fell. How many of you know they would have been happy to step over the rubbish to get over into Jericho? The Bible says that the wall didn't just fall where they had to step over, but the wall fell flat. He's an extreme God. Turn and tell your neighbor, he's an extreme God. Hallelujah. So here's seven things you must do in order to prepare your heart to dream beyond your means. Number one, and which I've already gone over it quite a bit, is you must believe and meditate on God's desire for you to increase. You must believe and meditate on God's desire for you to increase. There are so many scriptures in the Bible on increase. And what you have to do, you know, this is where the effort comes in. This is where the work comes in. You need to go through the word of God, find all the scriptures you can find on increase, and you need to start believing, hey, he's talking to me. You know, Proverbs 10, says, the blessings of the Lord make it rich. And he added no sorrow to it. He's talking about me. You know, Psalms 84, 11 says that he'll encompass the righteous with favor as a shield. He's talking about me. So you've got to believe every time you see a scripture on the increase, he is talking about me. And then you start meditating on increase coming in your life. Amen. And then number two, you must confess daily the knowledge and wisdom to dream beyond your means. I know you're saying right now, it's no way that I could dream beyond my means. But if you start putting pressure on your mouth and start confessing daily, I have the wisdom of God to dream beyond my means. Psalms 45, 1, you can write it down. The Bible says your tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are writing the script for your life with your tongue. So every day you need to confess, Father, I just want to thank you. I have the wisdom and knowledge to dream beyond my means. And the Bible says wisdom dwells with prudence finds out knowledge of witty inventions. You need to get some creative ideas so you can bring some wealth into the kingdom of God. So when you're confessing the wisdom of God to dream beyond your means, God wants to drop some witty inventions into your life. Why can't believers be some of the ones who discover the Microsoft program if there's another one that's going to come out? Why can't it be a believer that discovers that, you know, some kind of squeaky that'll help clean cars better? Why can't it be a believer? So you need to start confessing the wisdom and knowledge to dream beyond your means. Amen. And then number three, and this is the one that people don't like, turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. You got to eliminate all the sucker relationships that will drain your creativity. You must eliminate all. Listen to me. I didn't say some of them. Don't hold on to some of the suckers and let some of the suckers lose. Eliminate all the suckers that will, that will drain your creativity. You hanging around somebody, you leave here and you go back and you say, I was at that uh, women, woman thou art loose, God's leading lady, and everybody was talking about dreaming. And you know what? I just got re-invited, revitalized on my dream. I believe God's going to take me to higher height. And they said, girl, you ain't going to get none of that. Cut the suckers loose. You start talking about where you're going and what God has told you to do and what you're going to be doing. And they say, girl, that ain't never happened to nobody in your family. Ain't nobody in your family ever had nothing. You ain't, you ain't going to get nothing. Your family been on welfare all their life. Cut the suckers loose. Peter chapter 2. Get him out! Hallelujah! Second Peter chapter 2. Because believe it or not, the folk that you hang around are influencing the kind of person that you are. You can't fly with eagles and hang around with turkeys. 
You know, my son in Temple Hills, Maryland, he has a saying. He said, hang with those who have your answer. Get away from those who've got your problem. Yeah. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, hang with those yeah. who have your answer. Yeah. Get away from those yeah. who have your problem. Yeah. All right, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, T- making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly and deliver just lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Now look at verse 8. For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Them suckers are vexing your righteous soul. Cut the suckers loose. Try and tell your neighbor, say, cut the suckers loose. Cut the suckers loose. All right, and then number four, number four, understand that you have enough right now to start the abundant process in your life by participating in God's law of sowing and reaping. You have enough right now to start the abundance process by participating in God's plan for sowing and reaping. You know, when my husband and I first started out, we used to go to big meetings and boy, how we wanted to give big money. Oh my God, we wanted to give so bad. But we started where we were. You know, people were standing up and they were saying, 1,000, 10,000, 5,000, 15,000. And we were sitting there, 100. Why? Because we had just enough to prove to God that we could be trusted with more. You got just enough right now to start the abundant process with what you have to prove to God you can be trusted with more. And let me tell you something. Don't be trying to con God. Tell my God, if you give me $10,000, I'll give my tithes. If you ain't giving God $10 off the $100 you're making, you ain't going to give him no $1,000. You have enough right now to start the abundance process by tapping into God's plan of sowing and reaping. Let me tell you something. Something supernatural always happens when you give. Something supernatural always happens when you give. How many of you say we serve a supernatural God? Something supernatural always happens when you give. The Bible says in Luke 6, 38, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom. Who's going to cause the men to give into your bosom? God, something supernatural always happens when you give. Second Corinthians 9 and 6 says, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap also sparingly. And God will cause all grace to abound towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Who's going to cause the grace to abound towards you? Something supernatural always happens when you give. Trying to tell your neighbor, say something supernatural. supernatural. Always happens when you give. All right, I got about 10 minutes, so I ain't got a lot of time to stay on that. But something supernatural always happens when you give. Hey, something supernatural always happens when you give. Let me tell you something. My husband and I started giving when we didn't have much to give. We would stand up and say, we got $100 on the budget. We, that wasn't much compared to all the other people. But one day we were sitting in a service and the minister got up and he said, you know, I'm never coming back to Houston again. He said, I ain't never coming back. Y'all didn't meet y'all budget. He said, and so I ain't never coming back. And the way God speaks to me and my husband is normally he'll speak to us both at the same time. And so I got a witness that we were supposed to meet the budget. Well, now, in order for us to meet the budget, it was going to wipe out our savings account. It was money we had been saving up for months to buy this house in this certain neighborhood. And so we've been saving and saving. And so when God dropped it in my spirit, I was like, God, but that's going to take all our money. But then I remember something supernatural always happens when I give. So I leaned over the aisle. I said, did God say anything to you? He said, yeah. He said, meet the budget, but let's do half. So I gave him one of them mean wife looks. I like He said, okay, okay, we'll meet the budget. So he raised his hand, he said, we'll meet the budget. So the pastor said, yes. 
And Ira tells the story that after he did that, the devil was sitting on this shoulder and this shoulder and say, do you know what you just did? You gave away your savings. How are you going to get your house? When you get to closing, what are you going to do? But some supernatural always happens when you did. When we got ready to leave that night, people started walking up to us saying, Pastor Hillier, thank you for not letting our city go down in shame. Here's some money on what you did to help meet the budget. So our, his pocket was full of money. By the time we got to the park, people just started giving us money. Then when we got home uh, the, that Sunday after church, one of the members stood up and said, Pastor, thank you so much for meeting the budget. We didn't want our city to go down in shame, and so we want to give you more money. Members started coming up just giving us money. What have we have been working to say for months, God did it supernaturally in a matter of three days. Some supernatural always happens when you give. Hallelujah! Then number five, whew, decide to allow God to use your life as a channel of supply. Proverbs 11, 23, 25 says, the liberal soul shall be made fat. So if you decide, God, use my life as a way to channel money through for the kingdom of God. Guess what? If the money flows through your life, some of us got to stick to you. You ain't never got to worry about giving God everything. Because the Bible says God will never let you give anything to him that he won't give it back to you in a greater measure. How many of you know when water flows through a pipe, the pipe gets wet also? So if you decide, God, use my life as a channel to flow money through for the kingdom of God, God will bless you. I found this principle out several years ago, and I used to sit down and I say, God, make me a rich person so I can give to the kingdom of God. You know, my husband and I, we looked at Luke 638 one day and we said, it says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. Press down, shaking together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. So that means God got to speak to a man for him to get to me. So we said, hey, God, make me the man. <laughs> Instead of praying, God, bless me, make me the man. So when a child is praying about his tuition, make me the man, I can pay the tuition. When somebody needs a car, make me the man, I'll buy the car. When somebody needs a church building, make me the man, I'll finance the building. Hallelujah. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, make me the woman. Hallelujah. Then number six. Number six, develop relationships with other dreamers. Hebrews 6 and 12 says, follow those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Your imagination needs the stimulation of association with a successful others. Did you get that? Your imagination needs the stimulation of association with successful others. You need to start hanging around some dreamers. All this weekend, all we've been hearing is dream big. Think about the dream that you've got on the inside of your heart. You better get some phone numbers up in here and say, hey, when I need some encouragement, I'm calling you. Why? Because you need to hang around some other dreamers. How many of you heard the story about Mary and Elizabeth? The Bible says that when Mary got the word from God that she was pregnant with the baby Jesus, what did he tell her to do? He said, go find Elizabeth. So when she got to Elizabeth, Elizabeth, the Bible said the baby started leaping on the inside of Elizabeth. So when I hang around as a dreamer, my dream starts leaping and my dream starts leaping. Hey! You better hang with some dreamers. You know, you need to go some places where dreamers go. You may not can afford to buy a steak and a baked potato by right now, but go to a restaurant and get you some dessert. You need to know how rich folk eat. You need to know how rich folk act. You need to hang around some dreamers. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, hang around some dreamers. Yeah. Hallelujah. And then finally, whoo. Acts chapter two. 
chapter 2, the final point is you need to recognize who the real dream giver is anyway. Recognize who the real dream giver is anyway. The real dream giver is the Holy Ghost. My life got turned around when I got filled with the Holy Ghost. If you're not filled with the Holy Ghost today, you need to get the power of God working on the inside of you because he's the one who really is the dream giver. Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days. I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I'm going to read the Amplified version because it will be quicker. And it shall come to pass in the last days. God declares that I will pour out of my spirit upon all mankind. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, telling forth the divine counsels. And your young men shall see visions, divinely granted appearances. And your old men shall dream dreams, divinely suggested dreams. Now turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I can do this real quick. The Holy Ghost is the real dream giver anyway. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor yet heard, neither had it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that loved him. But God has revealed them unto us. How is he going to reveal it to us? By his spirit. What is he revealing to us? Those things that eyes have not seen. Nobody may have never done it before, but the Holy Ghost told me to do it. Ears may have never heard it before, but the Holy Ghost whispered in my ear and told me to do it. The Holy Spirit wants to impregnate you with his dream for your life. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. Not with a baby. But with abundance. And I feel abundance kicking on the inside of me. Turn and tell your neighbor and say, I'm pregnant. And abundance is kicking on the inside of me. You know, when a woman gets pregnant, there are several things that she has to do. She has to make preparations for the baby. You know, my daughter now is pregnant. And so a couple of days ago, they painted the baby's room and got the baby's furniture. Why? Because they're making preparations for the baby. So now that you're a dreamer, you got to start making preparations for your baby. You can't be like you used to be before. You can't walk like you used to walk before. Because my, now my daughter, she kind of swaying back now when she walks. Why? Because she heavy with child. Well, guess what? As a dreamer, you got to put your shoulders up. Walk like somebody that's pregnant. Abundance is kicking on the inside of me. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, abundance is kicking on the inside of me. Hallelujah. And then one thing about being pregnant is that if you're pregnant, you're going to have to deliver. One day, you're going to have to deliver. And when it's time for delivery, when you go in the delivery room, what they do is they say, when the pains intensify, what do they tell you? Push! Well, guess what? When the pains get worse, they don't say stop pushing. When the persecution arises, don't stop pushing. Keep pushing. Can I tell you never say, keep pushing. When 277 folk walked out for us, we couldn't stop pushing. We had to keep pushing. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, keep pushing. Keep pushing. Say, don't let nobody stop your dream from coming to pass. Keep pushing. keep pushing. Turn and tell your neighbor, say, keep pushing. Keep pushing. Be persistent until the supernatural happens. God bless you. In the future, I would love this channel to be an over the top platform, getting a play button, of course, and reaching a wider audience. And my aim is to point people back to God because tomorrow is not promised to anyone. We are in the last and evil days. Let's keep our ears open. In conclusion, I need your help. Your seed is important whether you're new to this channel or not liking the next video that I upload on any platform underneath catch my praise giving credit to where you get your sources also helps your generous gives of any amount or welcome catch up is always open under catch my praise 
Why am I doing this? Because it takes a lot to do a lot. Thank you for listening. Until then, believe it, reach it, catch it, here only on the Catch My Police Network.